Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Ijanik Miller. I am the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to welcome everyone here today to today's hearing. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Adrian Adams. Today's oversight hearing will examine pay equity issues within the New York City Department of Probation and the New York City Fire Department. This hearing will focus on pay disparities that exist, their effects on those, the work that is performed and the workers that perform the work. Pay equity means that the criteria employers use to set wages does not take into account gender, sex, age, or race. It means giving all people an equal chance to make a livable wage regardless of these factors. In April of 2018, this committee held hearings on a, and eventually passed Local Law 18 of 2019 which related to the reporting of pay and employment data, equity data within city agencies. The law will enable council to better understand where pay disparities exist within the city's workforce and help us to figure out ways in which to reduce the, these disparities. Although New York State has one of the smallest wage gaps in the nation, there still exists a gap within the state and the city of New York. Any gap is unacceptable and indicates that we as a city have a ways to go to create the balanced playing field that we all seek, regardless of gender, race, or ethnicity, or age. Thus, bringing this here in today is very important. Today we'll be looking at pay disparities that exist within the FDMY and DOP. Since, 19, ni since 1996 in New York City's Emergency medical services have existed as a bureau within the FDMY. However, its me members, mainly EMTs and, and paramedics, have been treated as civilian staff by the city. These EMS workers perform first responders' duties in similar capacity as firefighters and police officers and face extreme situations where their health and safety are on the line. Despite this, they are paid a fraction of what their first responder brothers and sisters made. For example, FDMY EMTs are paid a little more than $50,000 a year after five years of employment, yet the same time period, firefighters are paid $110,000, more than double the EMT rate. The pay disparity is shocking as EMT and paramedics provide vital care to the public and, and community in emergency situations throughout the city and they are predominantly women and people of color. In addition, the lack of pay in EMS workers are overworked and understaffed, with only 4,100 EMTs and, and paramedics working 2018 New York City handle nearly 1.9 million calls. The sheer volume of calls coupled with the lower wages indicates to me that EMS workers are handling hard working and deserve more and not just pay parity, but benefits that are similar or equal to that of their fire department counterparts. In addition to the FD, FDNY, there exist deep-rooted inequities within DOP. Probation officers provide a needed service in the city, supervising and helping those who have moved out of the criminal justice system to find meaningful services, including those related to education, employment, and health services. There are this, these are the people that are working to improve their lives and the, and the lives of those who were formerly incarcerated, those who many have given up on. They work to assimilate these formerly incarcerated individuals back into normal civilian life. Although this work can be demanded, it seems that these workers, of which are predominantly women and people of color, have been paid significantly less than comparable posts in other city law enforcement agencies and far less than probation officers in nearby counties like Westchester and Rockland, Nassau. I look forward to hearing from the administration on these issues and specifically want to know what is being done to mitigate and reduce these gaps. This committee wants to better understand how the administration values these workers and sets the pay rates that they receive with respect to the, their public safety and law enforcement counterparts. This committee wants to hear from 
those who live and work as EMT and paramedics, probation officers, and hear their stories, and regardless of the issues that we are presented here today in order to enact city policy to begin reduce these wage disparities. Finally, let me be clear on one thing. I am not saying that firefighters or correction officers or other city employees engaged public safety law enforcement do not deserve their respective salaries. These brave women and men are on call and running the blazing buildings to keep us safe, our families safe, and those who are at work with formerly and currently incarcerated, I am sure today, I'm here today to say that we are, as a city workers, along with the EMS, that we certainly stand behind you and the work that you do. And that the work is the pedestal of who we are as a society and that you deserve proper compensation with the work that you perform. I'm advocating on behalf of pay equity across all city agencies. I, we've been joined by, well, I saw Council Member Drum come in, uh, Council Member Moyer. I'd like to thank uh, the staff, my Chief of Staff, uh, Ali Rasulunajab, Brandon J uh, Clark, my Legislative Director, Senior Director Joe Drew Goldblum, and certainly commi the Committee Council, and the uh, Committee Malcolm, Kevin, Kendall, and Elizabeth. I look forward to hearing from the panel. We're going to begin with the admin, who's already taken the place, Stephen Rush, Laura Kavanaugh, Terrell Brown, Michael Forte, Anna Bermudez, and Wayne McKenzie. You could all raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer council member questions truthfully? If you could please state your name for the record before beginning. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller and members of the Civil Service um, and Labor Committee. I am Ana Bermudez, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation. Joining me today is my cabinet, Deputy Commissioners Sharon Goodwin and Janine Gray, sitting behind me, uh, Michael Forte, and General Counsel Wayne McKenzie. I'm here today to testify about the critical role probation plays across the criminal justice system, and in particular, the incredible work of DOP's probation officers in creating a safer city for all New Yorkers. As we have not previously appeared before this committee, I want to briefly describe probation's unique role in the community safety continuum. Probation is preventive, an alternative to incarceration, where a judge has determined that a person convicted of a crime can redress their actions while safely remaining in the community under our supervision. Probation is often confused with parole, which is a state agency, and they supervise people finishing the remainder of, their, of a prison sentence. Too often, public safety is narrowly defined as the absence of crime. However, we believe that true safety is much more than that. It is about trust and having a strong connection to the fellow human beings in one's community. Often when people come onto probation, that trust and connection has been eroded. Probation officers work to restore that trust by helping people change their behavior and connect to opportunities at roughly one-tenth of the cost of incarceration. We do this for more than 27,000 people each year, more than three times the city's average daily jail population by leveraging two things, risk management, which is the supervision, the intensity of the supervision and monitoring, and risk reduction, which is the supportive elements that help people to change. To accomplish this, probation officers work together with our government and community partners to support people on probation through the behavior change necessary to create what we refer to as their new now, basically to get out and stay out of the justice system. Nationwide, the role of probation is sometimes overlooked and often misunderstood, but always a crucial part of the criminal justice system. Here in New York City, probation officers perform a wide variety of important job functions in three main categories, pre-sentence investigations, the intake process, and the direct supervision of those sentenced to probation. 
In addition to the technical training and skills required of all peace officers, such as performing field work, executing warrants, and carrying a firearm for certain assignments, New York City probation officers need the capacity for creative problem solving, conflict resolution, violence prevention, strong communication skills, and the ability to think and act strategically to help people change their high-risk behaviors. It is a demanding job in an increasingly complex world. As the field evolves toward further decarceration, it is imperative that our focus is on working smarter. New York City probation officers are doing just that, and the results are extremely compelling. I do not think anyone can or really wants to put up a price on how much it costs to help transform someone's life. The countless success stories of people creating a new now for themselves in partnership with their probation officers are truly priceless. However, through independent evaluations of our programs, we have begun to establish a base of local evidence of what we have known for a long time, that the work of probation officers provides enormous cost savings and benefits to New York City by helping people to thrive safely in their communities. Let me briefly summarize the evaluations of three of our signature programs. Arches, AIM, and Neon Arts. Our Arches Transformative Mentoring Program for 16 to 24 year olds relies on probation officers working in partnership with credible messenger mentors. A February 2018 independent evaluation of Arches conducted by the Urban Institute found that one year after beginning probation, Arches participants' felony reconviction rates are 69% lower and two years later remain 57% lower. Any expert will tell you that these results are unprecedented. As the positive impact was especially high among 16 and 17 year old ARCHES participants, we recently launched a similar program targeted to our family court population to ensure that we prevent as many young people as possible from further justice system involvement. Last fall, we released the findings of another independent evaluation, also conducted by the Urban Institute for Advocate Intervene Mentor, or AIM our individualized alternative to placement program for high-risk youth ages um, 13 to 18. Over 90% of AIM participants avoided felony rearrest within one year and completed the program without incarceration, creating a cost avoidance for the city of more than $29 million, roughly one-third of our entire agency budget. From both a policy and fiscal perspective, this further exemplifies the critical role of community supervision performed by the probation officers of this department in helping to make New York City the least incarcerative and safest big city in the nation. Lastly, Neon Arts, which is our public-private partnership with Carnegie Hall's um, Wild Music Institute, has redefined innovative criminal justice programs by bringing together probation officers, people on probation, stakeholders, and local arts organizations to provide arts and cultural opportunities. The Neon Arts Evaluation builds on the 2017 Social Impact of the Arts Study by the University of Pennsylvania, which examined the impacts that access to arts and cultural opportunities had on underserved neighborhoods in New York City. It found that communities with access experienced 18% lower serious crime rate compared to communities that did not. The collaborative work of probation officers with Neon Arts is so transformative that the department received national recognition by winning the Excellence in Community Crime Prevention Award from the American Probation and Parole Association for the cutting edge use of arts in community corrections. And as part of the recently adopted fiscal year 2020 city budget, the council recognized and provided additional funding, funding for Neon Arts as part of the speaker's innovations in criminal justice initiative. And we thank you for your support. The impact and reach of our innovative work goes beyond the five boroughs, however. Beginning tomorrow, we're hosting a national conference attended by a variety of jurisdictions, including Los Angeles County Probation, Lewis, Lewiston, Maine Department of Corrections, Jackson, Mississippi Mayor's Office, the New York State Division of Criminal Justice, and the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, who will participate in a three-day immersion experience in order to replicate our groundbreaking Credible Messenger partnerships. These evaluations and national recognition are evidence of both the critical and cutting-edge role New York City probation officers play in creating real community safety, as well as the long-term cost savings gained by preventing incarceration and instead working to once change behavior in their community. Despite our department's incredible progress and great successes, 
the work of probation remains extremely challenging, complex, and dangerous. For those who choose this work, having a real probation family is something we value very highly. In my first few months as commissioner, I, I, I went to a retirement party for a probation officer who had been with the department for 44 years. That is remarkable, but not unusual. The current average number of years of service in the probation officer title series is nearly 30 years even when factoring in an unprecedented wave of new hiring done in preparation for Raise the Age. DOP is quickly, is, I'm sorry, uh, DOP is lucky to have such dedicated and loyal staff for the deep institutional memory and experience they bring to the agency. No idea I ever had was a new idea, by the way. It's always, Commissioner, we tried that in 1986, and this is how it went. So, so it's been a very enriching experience to have that. Um, and that continuity creates, it creates an incredible power for those on probation supervision, as well as for those who stay in touch with their probation officers for ongoing support long after the cases have closed. With the lowest national employment rate in 50 years and a thriving job market, market right, there, right here in New York City, our attrition rate of less than 10% is nothing short of remarkable and ensures the department has a very stable, diverse, and experienced cadre of nearly 700 officers committed to doing this important, life-changing work. The starting salary for a New York City probation officer, the qualification requirements for which include a baccalaureate degree and prior work experience, is currently $45,931. At the five-year mark, an officer's compensation is $56,657. And on the current salary scale, it reaches $64,858 at the final 20-year increment. However, with more than 20 years of service, an officer's compensation can and does exceed $70,000. Our new contract with the United Probation Officers Association, UPOA, which was overwhelmingly ratified last month, included general wage increases of 2%, 3%, and 3.25%, as well as a creation for the first time of a maintenance allowance and annuity fund. The makeup of our department's leadership reflects the composition of our officers and is evidence of how DOP values experience and my personal commitment to the development of staff and maximizing agency level promotional opportunities. Half of my cabinet and almost all of my senior leadership team is appointed from within the agency. Deputy Commissioners Janine Gray and Sharon Goodwin, the incredible women that lead the department's operations divisions, both started their careers with the agency as line probation officers. Uh, and in fact, DC Goodwin did better than that. She actually started with the agency as an intern. 30 out of 33 staff on our senior leadership team, which is 60% female, were internal promotions or reappointments. Among the ranks of our borough assistant commissioners and family court directors, which are the equivalent of county level appointed probation commissioner or director, all nine positions were appointed from within the agency. 100% of these discretionary appointments were filled by candidates who began their careers at the New York City Department of Probation as line probation officers. My tenure as commissioner has been laser focused on ensuring our staff is the best equipped and trained probation department in the country in order to both help elevate the status and the work done by the phenomenal people at this agency, as well as the important role of probation in the criminal justice continuum nationwide. One of our five agency drivers, in fact, is staff development, to which I have personally dedicated countless hours of training and ensuring that staff have access to a wide range of growth opportunities. In addition to our commitment to staff development, career growth, and maximizing promotional opportunities, we have also worked hard to raise the visibility of probation and the incredible work done each day by probation officers in New York City. We have launched several media campaigns in advance of each of our four probation officer civil service exams that we have held over the past year. This includes social media, bus shelter advertising, and print ads in publications such as Metro New York, Amsterdam News, Caribbean Life, Chinese World Journal, and El Diario. You can spot our latest media campaign, A Safer City for All, right now at the Link NYC locations, at Link NYC locations throughout the city. And it has paid off since 2018. In anticipation of Raise the Age, we recruited and trained nine new probation academy classes, resulting in just under 300 probation officers. 
Having said that, despite our great success in recruiting new officers and despite our laudable overall attrition rate, 71% of our attrition does take place during the first two years on the job. Addressing this was the agency's number one priority during the recently completed contract negotiation. While we were able to ensure that the salaries for new hires were not frozen and that their number of workdays did not increase as was being proposed, we believe there is more to be done and plan to continue to prioritize this issue moving forward. The question of fair and equitable compensation for probation officers is a legitimate one. It deserves careful analysis, open-minded discussion, and a collaborative process among all stakeholders to both properly scope the issue and determine a viable path forward. Chair Miller, I want to thank you for the opportunity to publicly address this and set the record straight. Last week, the Chief reported on a series of allegations that are personally heartbreaking to me. The City and the Department are being accused of having suppressed salaries while boosting responsibilities and workload as the numbers of women and people of color employed by probation increased. These allegations, I believe, do a terrible disservice to those who do and support the important work of probation. We have even learned of these allegations and actions when we received media inquiries asking for comment on them and not in a, in a different way. So let me address some of this. It is both untrue and irresponsible to claim that female probation officers are paid less. Not only are women and women of color well represented at the highest levels of management within this department, but the average salary of a female probation officer is actually slightly higher than the current average salary of a male probation officer. Other claims have been that the agency has devalued probation officers by suppressing wages at the low ends of the salary scales, frustrated step processes that lead to raises, and eliminated the senior position officer title. The probation officer title historically has and continues to have 17 increments with pay increases for each. No steps or longevity payments have been removed or eliminated. As for the senior probation officer title, it was declassified back in 2004 as part of civil service title broadbanding. The agency had stopped using the title in 2001 with only 14 officers ever appointed to that title since 1952. Although this preceded my administration by more than a decade, the continuity of leadership at UPOA going back to 2003 makes the allegation all the more puzzling. However, I want to reiterate that the question of fair and equitable compensation for probation officers is legitimate and deserves careful analysis to determine a viable path forward. Given all that has been accomplished by the officers of this department, as well as the important work we still have yet to do, I am personally committed to that path forward, which will require collective efforts and unity among our staff, those on probation, and our communities. The entire pro profession of probation is currently reckoning with its own new now, led in no small part by the work of this department. We now know that the former trail em, nail em, and jail em philosophy of community corrections did not work, and in fact did lasting harm and sowed distrust among the very people it purported to help. It created an us versus them mentality that devalued the profession and worse, destroyed trust between institutions and their communities. I strongly believe that the path forward in this circumstance requires a new now as well. As I said earlier, true safety is about trust. True community safety is a village around each and every one of us made up of family, neighbors, community organizations and government who work together creating a safer city for all. And that building and growing a village of people who are all responsible for the well-being of a particular client, place, community, or situation is how we get there. That is the essence of our work, creating a new now for people in probation in a one-size-fits-one approach so that together we're successful in our mission of strengthening communities and changing lives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the important work of the officers of the New York City Department of Probation. We're pleased to answer any questions you may have. Good afternoon, Chair Miller, and to the other council members who have joined us. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about pay and equity issues. I am joined today by Chief of Fire Operations, Thomas Richardson, Deputy Assistant Chief of EMS, Roberto Colon, 
Deputy Commissioner Terrell Brown, and Deputy Commissioner Stephen Rush. Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Nigro have made it a top priority to create a more diverse, more inclusive, and more equitable FDNY. Prior to the most recent firefighter exam, the department conducted a recruitment campaign unprecedented in its size and reach. We spent in excess of $10 million to expand and diversify the applicant pool by attracting more women and people of color than ever before. These efforts paid off and we exceeded our goals as a record-breaking 46,000 individuals took the exam. Compared to the previous exam, the number of Asian test takers increased by 55%, black test takers increased by 39%, Latino test takers increased by 29%, Native American test takers increased by 35%, and the number of female test takers who took the exam improved by 115%. For the first time in the history of the department, a majority of the test takers were people of color. More women took the firefighter exam than ever before. Commissioner Nigo also recently appointed Lillian Bonsignor as chief of EMS, the first woman and the first open, openly gay member of the LGBT community to hold the highest rank in the Bureau of EMS. He also appointed Alvin Suriel to the position of assistant chief of EMS, making him the first Latino member to hold the second highest uniform rank within EMS. In addition to the distinguished work that they will do on behalf of the people of New York, we are proud that Chief Bonsignor and Chief Suriel will also serve as examples of diverse leadership as we continue our mission to build a fire department that reflects the diversity of the city we protect. The fire department is, is as busy as it has ever been. Last year, we responded to 1.8 million incidents, including 1.4 million medical calls. This was an increase in total incidents of 84,000, or nearly 5%. Non-life-threatening emergencies grew by almost 7%, and life-threatening emergencies grew by 1%. Structural fires in the city were also up approximately 2%. I want to thank you, Chair Miller, for your collaboration with the department to strengthen fire safety outreach at the large event that we held at the Robert Ross Johnson Family Life Center in Southeast Queens. We appreciate your commitment to the safety of New Yorkers. The strength of the, our department is our members. We are only able to respond to the growing number of calls and to protect the lives and property of the people of New York City because of the hard work and dedication of our members. We currently have approximately 4,100 members in EMS and approximately 11,400 firefighters and fire officers. Each is committed to serving the people of this city, responding to fire hazards, medical calls, and a broad range of emergency conditions. FDNY firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics train extensively and work to develop specialized skills that they use to protect the city and its occupants. Firefighters and EMS members are currently negotiating the next contract with the Mayor's Office of Labor Relations. They perform incredibly difficult work that is vital to the safety of New York City, and they should be fairly compensated for that work. Although the resolution to the members' bargaining negotiations is not something that is within the control of the fire department, we hope that an agreement will be reached that is satisfactory to the members and the administration. I'd be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you for your testimony. So I, I, based on the testimony that we heard from each agency, it doesn't appear that we are not all in agreement about the, the value of the work that these two agencies and the specific bargaining units are performing. Um, if that is the case, that we agree that they are unilaterally overworked, undercompensated, um, certainly I, 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 in the case of probation, they're coming out of a a, a collective bargaining agreement, fire department currently engaged in negotiations. Um, how do we work towards pay parity if, in fact, you agree that pay parity with their counterparts in, in, in the uniform forces and in uh, the case of probation, other law enforcement agencies are warranted? So we continue to work with our partners in the union and our partners in the Office of Collective Bargaining to advocate for our members and to find creative solutions to uh, increase pay differentials and specialty pay for members of EMS. Like I said in my testimony, I think this is an issue that needs to be looked at for the Department of Probation um, and that 
we find an unfortunate situation when you look across across other jurisdictions, while yes, we get paid um, less than perhaps some of our counterparts in other um, counties in New York, there is a pattern that is also underpayment uh, or less payment than uh, the uniformed agencies, right? So when it's a complex issue, because as you then raise compensation for probation officers, then there's implications for others. That's why it's something that needs to be looked at. It's not a simple matter. With the information that we have uh, in, tr in front of us and the important role we play, um, you know, it definitely is something that we have to find a path towards improvement. So in, in terms of, and, and I want to appreciate the meetings that we've had together um, with your team along with the union and, and, and then separately and, and really engaging myself and this team and this committee um, on that progress and how we would be able to achieve that goal. Coming out of that, um, so um, there's a number of things and, and just the, the, the complex and the multi-level um, work that is being done by uh, probation officers. Uh, there is a law enforcement aspect. There's kind of a social worker aspect. It is also the criteria um, that is required and the qualifications that is qualified. Um, if you look at that, one would say that they are, are grossly un undercompensated for the, the, the work that they're performing. Um, I would submit that uh, in your testimony, you talked about the savings that have been achieved by virtue of the, the services that that um, are being delivered by by the workforce. I, I know within other collective bargaining agreements, there's things like gain sharing, and um, is that a conversation that has came up um, in terms of savings and whether that savings within the department could be then transformed on some level uh, to the membership and or have and, and I, I think we talked about other things and you talked about I think instead of you just implemented a uniform allowance is that so it is a um, it's not a uniform allowance as such since we're not a uniform equipment uh, yes yeah, there is a um, uh, hold on sorry an annuity it's one and it's a maintenance allowance. The term is, I'm sorry, I was struggling to find the term. Uh, a maintenance allowance um, for the clothing that officers, we've provided officers mm -hmm. um, within the past year, year and a half. Um, so what, what question do you want me to So, so to I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at, you, you said that, and we're gonna get over to the fire department because it was mentioned as well that you were exploring ways to kind of increase compensation and I know that we had some, some, some conversations as well, so I, I wanted to kind of be able to bring that out as well, some of the things that were happening, uh, some of the best practices that we have seen outside of, I, I think there's other ways I think that we can get there as well, but outside of um, some of the things that, you, that we have explored, is there something that we should hear about today? Is there an opportunity for, for longevities? Uh, pay as well, because one would think that a, could you explain the 17 increments? Right. So, so there are 17 steps up until year 20 of the, of a probation officer's uh, tenure at probation. So at the hiring rate, as I mentioned, um, is $45,934, right? And then it goes to 20 years or 17 steps toward in, 20 years to reach $64,858. So, so the increments are, are, are simply merely pay increments. There's no other um, requirements associated with that, no additional certifications, no additional education requirements. You stay on the job for, the, you reach those 17. Um, is that the case? Let me. Uh, I will pass this to Deputy Hi, Michael Forte. Um, it's a combination of steps, which the criteria is a performance evaluation, and longevities, which are purely just for the amount of service. 
So longevity, so longevity pay as defined in the collective bargaining agreement is specifically based on this increment. Is there a five, 10, 15 year increment if that um, is? It's right, it's a little bit unfortunately more complex than that. That's why there are 17 of them. So it doesn't cut nicely like in those ways, but from, from the day you're hired until the day you reach the 20th year, there are st both steps and longevities, and some of them happen at the same year. Do you know of another city agency that has anything similar to such a uh, uh, incremental, pay incremental step? Um, I think in concept, many agencies have the same structure that the, the titles and the salaries, basically, if you look at it, underlying the straight salary or these longevities or sometimes step increments. Combination of the two. I, I think it's, it's more unique or rare that you would see so many of them. They're, they're relatively small increments, and the other interesting thing is, you know, some of them happen at the same year. So, and, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, our desire, as the commissioner had pointed to, we, we, we see a huge problem early in someone's career, and we would like to see, you know, m those to be more aggressive earlier when someone what is What kind hired. of problem are you talking about? The problem of the attrition. Right, so, so we have an overall agency attrition rate of 10%, which when you look at it, it looks, it's good. Mm -hmm. But when you look deeper as to where the concentration, that what to see, we wanted to see whether there was a, a pattern or a concentration of something that we could, uh, that was uh, problematic, and we did. And the problem is that 71% of the attrition is happening in the first two years of employment. As we discussed previously, federal parole, federal probation starts calling, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so, so we were trying to, when we went, um, we wanted to make sure, we've been wanting to make sure that the early years are, um, you know, those steps and, and uh, happen as early as possible. So it's kind of an incentive? Yeah. So in my experience, in my brief 30 year labor experience here in the city of New York, and of course many agencies, that is such a unique, unique agreement. Most um, incremental uh, pay increments are probably five years you see now. It used to be mostly three. There are still some that have three, but they are also not in lieu of um, longevity pay. They are in addition to longevity pay. I, I, I would hope that you can go back and take a really, really strong look at that, get yourself more in line with the rest of the city agencies. I think that that's a, a space for an opportunity. Um, there are just, if, if you do the numbers, um, I think that you guys are way off step when after 20 years, you know, and 17 increments that we're just getting there, that there's, there's better ways to get you there. Um, also to consider things, um, there are other things that we can consider. Um, 20 years, that's a really, really long time to, to reach that most uh, agencies. And, and I, would, I would most, um, more likely uh, equate the job performances to the corrections department in which they have a, a five year um, top pay, uh, which is pretty consistent with most agencies. <laughs> okay. So obviously we know that there's a Taylor law that forbids us because you know we keep hearing from the admin that you know this is a collective bargaining issue. If we did what is prescribed by the Taylor law, we would never get to pay equity because everybody gets what everybody else gets, right? So we have to be a little more creative and I'm asking these two departments to figure out a way to demonstrate how much they really value their workforce. Particularly if there's savings, um, and lack of incarceration, can we, then, can we then transform, parlay that savings into some type of negotiated game sharing or something else? 
Uh, I appreciate that. We've been joined by Council Member Orridge, Council Member Danny Drum. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely, so fire department, how do you explain a, such a uh, large disparity between a top pay firefighter and a top pay um, EMT after five years? So I don't think we can explain that disparity that predates this administration, but I think speaking to what you just said, we are absolutely committed to advocating for our workforce in the collective bargaining process. Um, we are just in the initial stages, so we're having conversations with the union and we're having conversations with OLR to try to come up with that list of creative ideas mm -hmm. um, so that when we sit down at the table, we can look at ways, whether it's um, savings, differentials, different allowances, uh, to advocate for our, our members and their pay and their could, compensation. Could, 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 could you talk about the training of EMTs and how much... Um, how much training they're required to have to come on the job certifications and so forth, and how much training, uh, how much is it cost in the department to, to, to train? And then also, and then finally talk about the attrition rate. Sure, so it's about four months of initial training for an EMT, um, for our regular EMT program. We also have an EMT trainee program that we recently implemented that um, gets people essentially from scratch with no EMS training whatsoever. Um, and then it's about nine months for a paramedic to be trained. And I'm going to let the chief expand on that a little bit more. Okay. All right. So when uh, an EMT comes into the system, if they're, um, we have a new trainee program. Mm -hmm. So there's just basically a, a civilian that just comes in uh, with nothing, no experience whatsoever. They're trained from uh, the very beginning, basic. Um, that's a 16-week program, and they train from the very beginning. They have no knowledge whatsoever to become an emergency medical technician. Um, they train in um, uh, medical emergencies, trauma emergencies, and they prep them up for, uh, for the New York State exam. <clears throat> and when they go through the whole uh, course, for the 16-week program, uh, they train in uh, our department's policies and procedures. Uh, uh, they train how to operate our ambulances. They train how to uh, deal with medical emergencies, trauma emergencies, uh, respond to mass casualty incidents, how to, how to operate on those uh, assignments. All this to prep them for the New York State exam to become emergency medical technicians. And that takes them for the four months to become emergency medical technicians in the field. Uh, that's the four month program. I think it's also worth mentioning, uh, there is a capacity issue at the EMS training academy. And so in terms of promotional opportunities within EMS, including being a paramedic, we were limited by our capacity at the academy and we received $52 million in this most recent budget to expand that capacity. So we're hoping in the upcoming years, we'll have a greater ability to offer more spots for people within EMS to promote within EMS. And how, how long, you said years, how long, what's the anticipation on that capital project? Sorry, what was that? Repeat. You said it, it, it may take years? What? We believe we can initially begin to expand, so it'll take a few years till we can expand uh, to the level that we would like. But even in the upcoming classes, we hope to see additional spots for paramedics. Um, and it, this is also at no cost to them. We've implemented um, a for forgivable loan program, again, in order to expand opportunity for people within EMS to promote to the rank of paramedic. So um, from, from a paramedic perspective, how much uh, is the department spending on training? On the paramedic training, I believe the per student cost is probably, I believe it's, and I'll have to check the numbers, about 22000 per 22. student. How much is the, uh, and do you know how much your EMS training would be for those individuals? How long? EMS. How long? How, how much is the training 
For EMT, you're talking now. I'm looking at EMS. EMS. EMS is EMT or paramedic. Mm hmm You might define the paramedic for you. I'm not, I'm not following what you're asking. Entry level, how much? EMT. Yes. Uh, it's significantly less. I don't have that number, but it's significantly less than a paramedic training. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Council Member Adams for questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, this issue is something that is so very prevalent across the board. It crosses race, it crosses gender, it crosses uh, decades of disparity, and I just get really confused when I take a look at the numbers because they are glaring across the board. It, they are glaring when it comes to uh, New York City probation, and they are horrifying when they come to FDNY. So um, my, my first question is going to be, what is the criteria that is used to set uh, EMT salaries versus the salary of a firefighter? All city titles, civil, civil service titles, um, are negotiated through Office of Labor Relations. These are historic rates that <clears throat> DC 37, as the parent of local 2507, 3621, um, has negotiated since CMS was born probably in the 1970s. Um, and those rates were established initially in collective bargaining and in, in, in conjunction with OLR and DCAS. The fire department was not involved in rate setting. Obviously, we, we merged with EMS in 1996, so we took over that workforce into the fire department, and we think, we've thought that <clears throat> since we, they've come over in 1996, there's been a lot of strides taken by the department to improve things. Obviously, pay compensation is still a serious issue, but we think we've taken a, a, a significant number of steps to improve um, a matter for EMS personnel. There is and I just would add one thing, the administration um, since 2014, there's a thousand, new um, positions for EMS at a cost of $52 million since uh, this administration came into um, in 2014. Yet with EMS, there is still tremendous amount of overtime that has to take place in order for a single parent to feed her family. So I, I appreciate that. Um, we're, we're just looking to, to really, really get to, to, to the bottom of the bottom uh, of this tremendous disparity between the ceiling and the floor. Uh, when it comes to this pay structure. So we've heard the mayor say in the past that there is a difference between uh, firefighters and EMS. I think we all know that. Um, I, but the spirit in which that statement was made, there is a problem with that statement. Um, can you further explain what could have possibly been meant by that statement in that difference? Because in that difference, he was speaking specifically about the pay disparity between the two. I can't speak to that. I can speak to the fact that both members of EMS and FIRE are some of the most tremendously hardworking people I have ever met with some of the hardest jobs of anyone I have ever met. And like I said before, we've made a significant investment into new members of EMS in this administration, but we also remain committed to advocating for them in the collective bargaining process um, and doing what we can as a department uh, to, to help advocate for them as we move forward. I appreciate that. Thank you. So does the city consider EMS civilian or uniformed? Well, they wear a uniform, as you know. We call them uniform members in the department. But as far as OLR is concerned, they are not considered uniformed for collective bargaining purposes. And Do you again, see that changing? Do you see that changing at all? That would be a question for OLR. Well, that's, that's very significant in the perception. And it gives, it, it, it really, really gives a, a clearer picture of, of why all of this is taking place. That perception uh, is, is provided in what you just said. Uh, very, very disturbing. Um, so aside from collective bargaining, is there anything else that's being done to reduce the gap? In terms of 
salary. It has to be done in that process, but we are extraordinarily committed to being advocates in that process. Do you, do you foresee uh, in the future any kind of timeline where we're going to see substantial improvement? Just what are your feelings about the timeline and the process and the procedure? So the timeline for bargaining, we're in initial conversations now, as I mentioned. We haven't come to the table, but we do expect that to be in the near future. In the next six months, 12 months? I certainly hope so. I think you could uh, ask our friends at the union that question as well, as I we will. both have a, a part of that process. But yes, that's what we would hope for. Okay. Uh, again, I appreciate your testimony here today. The, the subject, uh, to me as a black female, uh, is extremely disturbing to continue to see this go on uh, for decades. And we know probation also overwhelmingly uh, women um, supporting families. I keep throwing that out there because we are talking about a far-reaching issue that is that goes way beyond a table. It goes into families. It goes into neighborhoods. It goes into perception. It goes into conversation. So my hope is that in all of the discussion around this issue is that we really, really take to heart the extended view and what this actually means to the communities that are being supplied by the salaries of, salaries of these hardworking individuals. There's just so more that needs to be done um, with the, uh, the, in the area of, of probation. Let's say we're looking at 20 years uh, before there is an increase. That's, that's a, a tremendous issue. So the, the Got it. The, uh, apologies. It's the difference between probation and correction. I'm sorry about that. I, I think you kind of knew where I'm going. I'm getting a little <laughs> bit emotional in my train of thought. But it, it all goes around the same particular subject in the same particular area for me. For me, in both areas, the ceiling and the floor, uh, we really need to try to bring them closer together in meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Adams. Um, to FDMY, um, you're talking about that you're currently or about to be in, engaged in contract negotiations. Um, have you had any conversations with the admin and OLR in terms of advocating for um, EMS MT to become um, unified, uniform forces? a part of the uniform forces. Obviously, that's where we're going to see the difference in the uh, pay disparity have the, the greatest difference. We are having conversations with them, yes. And based on the work that they do, the educational certification backgrounds, all those things like that, is it something that it is, uh, those conversations are fruitful? Do you think this? this hearing is going to be helpful in your advocacy on behalf of your workforce today? I think it will be. Um, since 1996, and uh, them joining the FDMY, uh, do they have more or less responsibility? Medical calls have certainly increased year by year, um, certainly in the last decade, and I think since 1996, medical calls in the city of New York. Um, there's also, <clears throat> obviously since 9-11, um, there has been additional um, duties assigned, both on the fire side and the EMS side, counterterrorism task force, we also have members in our has, has TAC units. Mm -hmm. um, they receive additional compensation that was negotiated between the city and the union. And there's also a rescue medic pay, which was provided um, uh, several rounds ago in collective bargaining negotiations for an elite group of paramedics who are trained in certain difficult rescue situations. So those kind of duties have evolved, um, particularly since 9-11. But, but, but and, and I can appreciate that, but the, the general compensation for the overall bargaining unit has not 
unless you are engaged in one of these specific uh, units, specialized units. Is, is that the case? Um, what is, and I don't know if you answered the, the question about attrition. What, what is the attrition rate? Uh, attrition for members of EMS is about 6%. Six? Six, six yes. Do you, when someone leaves EMT to go become a fire fighter, is that included in that number? That is not included in that number because they stay within the department. So they stay within the department. What's the it's 9%. So, it's 9% if so you include the promotional exam. If, if, if you included the promotional, it would be 9, nine, nine. annually? 9%. Hmm. Okay. And, and what are the demographics uh, of EMS, EMT? EMTs are about 64% uh, women and people of color. And fire and fired firefighters? Firefighters, about 30% women and people of color. Okay. And in, in, in terms of hiring um, for fiscal, the next fiscal year, um, what do your hiring numbers look like? Are, are you okay? Or do you need to hire over the next year? <clears throat> now we generally hire three classes of EMTs. Um, there's a, um, usually about a 180, but starting in February, as, as First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh indicated, we'll, we'll increase the EMT class size from 180 to 240. Generally, our paramedic classes are 75 in that neighborhood. We'll probably increase, increase it to 90 and eventually to 120 um, once we get the academy expanded in, in 2020. Is that indicative of the workload that is currently being undertaken by the workforce? I, a lot of it is a factor of the, of the promotional exam that enables a significant number of EMS members to promote to the title of firefighter. We've lost probably close to over 800 personnel in, the, in three uh, promotional exams so far, uh, promo, promotional classes so far. So you would say that it's majority attributed to attrition and not necessarily uh, the workload? I, I, can't. I would say that it's both. As I mentioned, we hired 1,000 new members over the last few years, and that is to address the workload. So the combination of the promotional exam and the increased headcount uh, has created that need for additional hiring. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really, again, interested in, in, in uh, how we kind of get to where we need to be in, in terms of compensation. Could you talk to me about, um, about overtime and overtime pay? Is it mandatory overtime? And, and then what does that budget look like? Last year, I think, believe, and I'll say this fiscal year is now being completed, EMS overtime was about $50 million. Um, there is overtime that you can volunteer for, and there is mandated overtime as well. Um, in, in discussions with the union, we have relaxed the overtime cap to allow members to work additional overtime. Obviously, as you've, you've noted yourself, that ideally there's a certain level of overtime where it becomes difficult for members, um, some members more than others. Um, but there is um, plenty of overtime opportunities for EMS right now because of the vacancies. And, and you said that the, the, the salary cap, the overtime cap, um, ha, ha, has, has been relaxed? In it's some currently 50% of salary. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, it would enable one person, an average EMT, to earn up to 600 hours if one wanted to work that much. So, yeah, that, that, that would be a concern. That's a lot of um, Obviously, considering the critical services that they provide, you know, I, I want someone at their optimum performing. Uh, uh, the average EMT overtime is approximately about $7,000, so it's far less than that. It's obviously, 
This is the average. Um, there are some people who work a lot more and some who work less. So, but obviously th th these, these uh, calls have to get answered. So we have to figure out a way to make sure that the bodies are there and that somebody's doing, doing the work. And so that kind of goes back to, to um, what the hiring and, and attrition question is and, and whether or not um, it is fair that people in order to earn a living wage have to work they have to double, work overtime to double their salary. That, that is the, the, the question here, and whether or not that is um, safe for the public um, in doing so, that we want people, again, at their optimum performing abilities when they come in to uh, service our citizens. Um, Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just had uh, just a couple more questions because I've been looking at the graphs and, and, and it's still so, so disturbing. I just have to get this out there. Is FDNY able to come to the bargaining table on your own and handle this issue of pay equity and just say, look, we're just going to handle this? We are speaking of predominantly women of color when it comes to um, EMS. And pay equity shouldn't be something that's negotiable or negotiated, in my opinion. Is there, is, is there a commitment that you are willing to make to ensure pay equity at this level? It's something that's certainly doable. Are you willing to make that commitment? So I think, unfortunately, the FDNY doesn't have the power to unilaterally raise salaries. We can commit to um, absolutely looking at ways to diversify our workforce, ways to grant additional pathways to promotions for members of EMS, and ways to advocate for their salaries and their benefits at the bargaining table. We will commit to that. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to ask um, that you do that very strongly, very forcefully. Uh, the, 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 the strand of, and I'll just put it out there, systemic racism is, is, is blinding and deafening. So uh, in order to right that wrong, I think that it is imperative and incumbent on everyone that's sitting around, everyone that has the authority, the power, and the voice to make that happen. When we look at the racial disparity between FDNY and EMS, in the year 2019, and we're still talking about pay equity, pay parity, issues of that nature. We're looking at women, we're looking at men, just, just all of it. The picture for a city like New York is just, the optics are horrible. So I'm just going to ask that we all just pitch in there together and really try to get this done for the hard workers, the hard EMS workers out there. We absolutely believe in our members and we are committed to advocating for them in that process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Could we go back to the mandatory overtime? What percentage of overtime goes towards mandatory overtime? I wouldn't know that number offhand. We can get that to you. Okay. Um, going back to the demographics, FDMY, um, could you talk about the managerial or supervision and then managerial within the agency? What are those demographics? Sure. At which rank or across talk the Talk about the ranks. I'm not as familiar with the ranks. Could you? Um, so over the last five years, um, we have committed primarily to diversifying the firefighter rank because, as you know, with civil service, uh, when tests given every four years, we have not had an opportunity to see those more diverse classes that we've seen in the last five years have an opportunity to take those promotional exams. But we currently run mentorship programs and career development opportunities to make sure that as soon as they are eligible, we will see that diversity rise up through not the ranks. Not talking about firefighters. On the EMS side? Correct. We are doing the same. 
You are? We are doing the same on the EMS side as well. What, what, what are the current uh, supervisory and managerial demographics? So we have four EMS captains. They are 53% white, 14% black, and 23% Hispanic, and 8% Asian. Mm -hmm. For EMS lieutenants, it's approximately 53% white, 19% black, 22% Hispanic, and 5% Asian. So, so that's pretty consistent, and those are consistent with civil service exams, correct? That they are consistent with civil service exams, but as I mentioned, this administration has been tasked with ensuring that people have opportunities to promote and that they're being encouraged to promote and mentored to promote. And so that is an initiative we actually- Those aren't appointments, are they? Those aren't what? Those, and none of those positions are appointments, are they? So they do not take a civil service exam in the same way that FIRE does. They do uh, an interview process, but that is subject to change. A law was passed in the state last year uh, that would eventually implement the same type of testing process for EMS. So you, 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 you don't have a civil service exam for a promotion and the, and, and the numbers are just not consistent with the workforce. We will have a test for civil service exams based on this new law. We do not at this time. Why haven't you? That predates this administration. I'm not sure why that is. Okay. Oh, sorry, I, I should correct myself. There is one for lieutenant. It's above lieutenant that we do not have those exams. And how many oh. positions are above lieutenant? Um, we have captains, deputy chiefs, division chiefs, deputy assistant chiefs, so a few ranks above lieutenant. And is there any consistency between the pay there and the FDNY? I'm oh, yeah, we say oh, it's consistency as compared to is the, what, what are the disparities at those ranks compared to There are significant differences between EMS supervisory personnel and fire supervisory Consistent personnel. with what we see at the lower ranks as well? Yes. Correct. What about civilians within the agencies? Civilian managers. Civilian titles within. run across many, you know, you have many high level computer titles, but generally the civilian probably average salaries is you have any civilian managers? When you managerial in the managerial pay plan, there are civilian managers. The compensation will vary up to the level of a deputy commissioner or a fire commissioner, but you know they start off probably um, far lower. Than, obviously, far lower than that. The, is, is that is that pay scale set by the, the 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 agency, the department, or DCAS? Who sets those pay scales? The managerial pay plan for non-unionized personnel in the city is established um, as a step plan by DCAS and the raises, the raises that are given to managerial employees generally mirror those that are given to their collectively bargained counterparts. So, so here's what I'm saying. You could have a citywide manager who qualifies who could be placed in a multitude of different agencies are they more apt or like Leslie to pay, to earn more at a fire department or Department of Homeless Services? I, don't, I really can't answer that. I, I would just You know say what the average salary of a manager and, and the fire, uh, a civilian manager in the fire department is? We couldn't say what the average. There's so no, many okay. different titles and so many different units. Um, I would say that for the highest ranking, How do we access that information? We can get that to you. Oh, yeah, because that was part of the last pay equity. That's how we came up with the local law that manages um, specifically women of color, uh, depending on what agency were being paid disproportionately um, from their counterparts. And, and they pretty much had the same qualifications. And so certainly this is about pay equity and, is, and, and particularly as it pertains to these two agencies. And I would submit the same question uh, for probation as well. Um, do you have an answer from on the probation side? The, the, are, are managers generally paid uh, 
consistently more or less than, than counterparts in other agencies? That's all, I wouldn't know how to answer that question in this sense. Probation is very unique in that its civil service title is not transferable to other agencies. So when you move up the ranks, you move um, probation officer, supervising probation officer, um, administrative probation officer, which oftentimes leads to the managerial positions, right? And so um, th those counterparts, it's hard to establish counterparts in other agencies. Um, because the titles are different and they go with different um, salary structures. So we can follow up with that. Um, but as a man, say, say for instance, uh, a mid-level manager that is, is, is not necessarily doing specific probation, uh, does not require a probation background, but Got whatever this. they're doing, backroom stuff, um, is, is that consistent with, with, with other agencies or do you have any idea what that looks like? Yeah, I, we will check. Okay. But I, if I, I were to guess, because we're a smaller agency, I would say no. It's not comparable. Okay. I, I, would, I would appreciate that information. Uh, Councilmember Adams? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I promise this is going to be my last one. Um, First Deputy Commissioner, I think you could probably get this one. You, you just gave uh, Councilmember Miller the uh, racial breakdown for EMS and, and FDNY. Can you give us the gender breakdown as well? Sure. Um, on the EMS side, uh, we have about 28% women. And on the fire side, it's about 1%. That's why we wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. Sure, I, I think I would just say the fire department definitely agrees that we have a lot of work to do on that front, but I would also note um, that we have doubled the percentage in the firefighter rank uh, in its diversity. We've also doubled the number of women and we remain committed to keeping that trend going. Okay, so we will follow up. We have obviously tons of follow-up questions. I appreciate um, your time, you coming out, and this is very, very important to the council. Obviously, it's more important to the members that provide such critical services um, to, our, to our city. I, I, I absolutely believe that this city has value um, because of its workers. There's a reason why 67 million folks come to New York City to visit. There is a reason why Amazon and Google and all these other folks want to set up shop, because we are safe, we are clean, we have good transportation, uh, despite all of those narratives, because of the men, men, women and men that provide those services, many of which that are in the room today. And um, so I, I hope that we can continue this dialogue, get us to the point that we can creatively make sure that they're being compensated justly in the future. And, and, and this committee is absolutely committed to it. So anything that we can do to be able to support your efforts in getting them there, we do have that commitment now. So thank you for your testimony. We appreciate that. Thank you. Next panel, Sylvani Powell, Fenton, and Oren. And Michael Greco.
Thank you. Um, you can begin your testimony um, from either end, whatever. Just please push the button, hold the mic, and identify yourself before giving your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Dalvin e. K. Powell, and I'm the President of the United Probation Officers Association. I represent over 800 probation officers and supervising probation officers and more than 400 retirees. My membership consists 90% of people of color, of which 78% of them are women. We are honored to have been invited to participate and to testify in discussion of pay, dis pay disparity. And for time's sake, the commissioner did a good job, I must say, in describing who we are and what we do. So I'm going to skip that part. But I will say that our primary concern as officers is, community, is, is primarily community safety. But what wasn't mentioned was that we have a field service unit who who make, who, excuse me, field visits, field visits are made in some of the most dangerous neighborhoods. Probation officers are in, uh, are in just as much risk as other law enforcement officers. Probation officers are required to work various shifts, including evenings, weekends, and holidays. We have an intel unit of probation officers who execute, execute warrants within the New York and other states. Within this unit, we also have a cyber unit. These officers work with NYPD, Department of Corrections, U.S. Marshals, Homeland Security, and many other enforcement officers. What also was not mentioned was that the investigations reports that we use are also utilized by the Department of Corrections, upstate and downstate, and the department and our reports are also used by the Department of Parole when making a determination for a person um, to get out of jail, prison. For the sake of time, I've attached to your to my presentation the description of a job of a probation officer and a supervising probation officer. Probation officers are required to complete eight weeks of training, which consists of fundamentals, defensive taxes training. We must satisfy the training requirements established by the state of New York for peace officer certification. Hence, probation officers are peace officers who carry firearms and make arrests when necessary in order to enforce public safety. We recently ratified our contract with a total of increase of 7.25%. The hiring rate for probation officers will be $45,934, and the maximum salary will be $76,043. For the promotional position of a supervising probation officer, the salary will start at $61,276, and the maximum rate will be $91,518. Since we're here to discuss pay disparities, the above salaries may appear to be impressive to some, but the sad reality is that none of the, none of the titles that I represent ever reach their maximum salaries. Please see the attached chart which shows the growth of our salaries, how it would look after the wage increase is applied. A probation officer after 11 years will only earn $52,824, and for a supervising probation officer after 16 years will only earn $70,467. These numbers will vary depending on when and how one came into the agency. As you can see, we have no guarantee when we will reach our top salary, unlike our other brothers and sisters in law enforcement and our other probation officers in Nassau County, Westchester, and Suffolk County, who, I might add, are required to have the same education experiences as, as us and also has to adhere to the same state mandates as we do. Over the years and since the Razor Age has been implemented, the department has hired a significant number of new recruits. However, we have lost more than 15% of the seasoned and new officers because of the low salaries. When this happens, everyone loses, especially the community at large. Therefore, when we think of criminal justice reform, you should think of probation officers as our objective is to help change the mindset of those men, women, and youth who come through the doors of our who come through our doors because of the poor choices they have made, which in turn will reduce recidivism and keep the community safe. When you think of the bail reform, you should think of probation officers as there are thousands of cases where probationers remain, when persons remain in the community receiving services at predisposition and not behind bars, thereby saving the city millions of dollars. When you think of reduction of mass incarceration, you should think of probation officers because we are saving the city and the state billions of dollars while we supervise and monitor those who have been convicted of a criminal act instead of being incarcerated. When you think of community po policing, you should think of probation officers as we are out there in the field risking our lives while we saving lives. When you speak of low crime rate, please think of probation officers. In conclusion, we the members of the United Probation Officers Association would like to have someone explain why in 2019 we have to come and c come with cup in hand 
asking that it be filled so we can live, take care of our families now and in the future. Why are we struggling to get what we worked so hard for and deserve, but yet we are being denied because of our gender and the color of our skin? This pay equity needs to be corrected now in order to recruit and retain the best possible candidates. And at some point, I have two of my colleagues, supervising probation officer Emma Stovall and probation officer Felice Finch, I would like to have the opportunity to tell their story how these low salaries have impacted our lives over the, their lives over the years, if, if, if um, need be. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Owen Barzalay, president of the uniformed EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors of FDNY Local 2507. Thank you for allowing me the chance to address you today with regards to one of the most pressing issues facing the stability of emergency medical service. The FDNY EMS is in crisis. The ability to promptly and adequately respond to citizens in life-threatening situation is diminishing every day due to the personal crisis created by an inadequate and substandard wage pattern, as well as personal practice that routinely depletes the ranks of EMTs and paramedics. This pattern and practice is caused by bias, which leads to devaluing of EMS side of the FDNY. These patterns of bias are so ingrained that even some of the efforts to address lack of diversity and equal opportunity end up instead of perpetuating the problem. Our members are consistently paid less for the life-saving works they do than the life-saving works performed by other within the department. By way of example, the fire, the fire department routinely promotes 900 EMTs and paramedics to the firefighting title in an effort to address this issue with lack of diversity. It draws on, large, on the large amount of female and minority members in EMS to try to do so. Using the term promotion underscores the devaluation of the EMS side of the department. Moreover, members who choose to avail themselves of this practice often cite the inadequate wages they received in EMS as the reason. Despite their love for providing emergency medical services and an EMT, as an EMT or paramedic, they, they were driven to leave EMS and move to the fireside. But more egregious is that this practice ignore, ignores the devastation it has on the EMS side of the department, reinforcing a sense that EMS work is lesser than other first responders, all while pulling experienced EMTs and paramedics from the workforce, resulting in decreased work morale and retention. Our members are consist consistently paid less for the life-saving work they perform as compared to other lifesavers within the department. I know there is an image that firefighters fight fires, EMS workers transport people to the hospital. EMS is, is much more than transport service. Our EMTs and paramedics perform on-scene rescue and life-saving functions, actually working up and treating patients on scene and while being transported. We treat sick and injured New Yorkers in the pre-hospital setting every single day of the year. But the work of the FDOI is even more complex. And EMS and fire work together in an integrated way that provides much more than emergency transport. This work of often overlaps. For example, both the fire side of the department and the e EMS side of the department process emergency calls and dispatch tens of thousands of emergency responses. Yet this, despite being in the same building on the same floor, and even though EMS workers process significantly more of these calls, the fireside employees are paid more. The Office of Recruitment and Training literally has, the, has integrated unit in which EMS and fireside employees work together. They attend the same training, recruitments, and complete the same projects, yet EMS employees make significantly less. 
Obviously, EMS members provide different life-saving services in the field, but aren't these services just, just as valuable as the other services the FDNY provides and many of the services that the department performs, such as call processing, are not in the field? Furthermore, the FDNY is the only agency that has a different rate of pay for the same titles within its own agency, depending on whether the title is on the predominantly of color and largely females, female side of the EMS or the predominantly white and male fire side. These issues might just seem like pay inequality issues, but they have devastating effects on the department the impact this has is one of the most pressing issues facing the stability of the emergency medical service. Other city entities claim that retention and attrition rate are within what we will be described as normal limits. Do not be duped. The fact is 80% of new hires in EMS live within four years. When they leave, they take well-honed clinical expertise with them. This, when coupled with a recent and an ongoing wave of retirement creates a naive, inexperienced, and marginally prepared workforce. The contrast begins, the demographics and corresponding pay on both sides of the fire department could not be starker. While the fire side of the department struggles with an alarming lack of diversity, the EMS struggles with an equality, alarming lack of compensation for its members' work. Based on the 50 year salary, an EMT makes 46% and a paramedic makes 30% less than other first responders. Let me re remind this body, this is not a complaint against other New York City first responders who do heroic work and should be fairly compensated. It is a complaint against a department that has refused to accept the reality that there is bias in the way that they value and compensate its employees. Granted, there is a vast difference in base hours and contractually guaranteed overtime. However, the hourly rate exemplifies the same vast differences. And the fact that we have not had the same opportunities to, to collectively bargain is not an excuse for discriminatory pay practices. Some have attempted to deflect by saying that our pay is less because we have not been as effective in collective bargaining. Such a claim ignores the the pervasive bias that has created and perpetuates this issue. Again, the fact that we have not had the same opportunities in collective bargaining is not an excuse for discriminatory pay practices. It is yet another example. The uniformed DMTs, paramedics, and inspectors of Local 2507 has, have a short history of bargaining, and despite the laws that require us to be treated as a uniform service, we are not always treated as so. The current practice of patent bargaining, by its nature, discriminates against the titles I represent by not letting us be at the table as equals. Although we are, for the purpose of collective bargaining uniform members of the FDNY, we are consistently offered lower wage percentages than other uniform agencies, and when we challenge why, we are told we are civilians. In the 2016 round of negotiation, we addressed the issues of base hours and guaranteed overtime by proposing an alternative work chart of 12-hour shifts. The city has agreed to a limited pilot program. Today, three years later, despite our ability to demonstrate massive savings by fully adopting the alternative work charge, the program remains limited pilot. Over a year ago, we asked the city for pay data so that we could better understand how our members were being harmed by potentially discriminated pay practices. Rather than work with us to get us this information and correct these problems, the city denied our FOIL request. Despite the fact that this committee and the city council recently passed legislation to require the city to provide pay data that would eliminate discriminatory pay practices, the city has fought us tooth and nail, requiring us to spend time and resources litigating the issue of whether or not we should be allowed to receive the race and gender of our members and their comparators. 
The city has even refused to provide this information when we offered that the names be redacted and anonymized. In closing, let me say that a commitment to non-discrimination in the workforce is a commitment to excellence. The ability of the FDY to provide the highest level of emergency preparedness for the largest and busiest EMS system does not come cheap. It, re it requires valuing the workers, paying them fairly, ensuring equal employment opportunities and proper recognition of their sacrifices. This is my testimony. I took some notes during the hearing process. Do you want me to address them now or let the others testify and we'll get back to them later? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Miller and distinguished member of the City Council, uh, Councilwoman Adrian Adams of the Civil Service uh, Labor Committee. My name is Vincent Variali. I'm president of the Uniformed EMS Officers Union, Local 3621 of the New York City Fire Department. Uh, I represent over 500 EMS captains and lieutenants. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify on the issue of pay inequity and in the city workforce. As you have heard from others, the issue with pay inequity is a citywide problem. Today, I will provide you with some more insight into the problems and struggle within our department. Since merging with the fire department in 1990s, 1996, EMS has felt the institutional challenges the department has grappled with, with regards to bias in all aspects of its operations, from the work culture, hiring, promotions, pay, and resource allocation within the department. As a report put out by the Citizens Budget Commission notes, the merger of EMS into the FDNY was not accompanied by a fundamental transformation of the organization and staffing of the FDNY. As a result, the FDNY has not efficiently addressed the changes in the roles in the department and perpetrates a decades-long culture of discrimination and bias. One problem our members have had to deal with, with as a result of this is the lack of unbiased promotional processes that result in the loss of proper diversity and the bleaching of the EMS ranks. While a recent state law was passed requiring, requiring the city to put in place a civil service exam for promotion, as of yet, they have not done so. And there is no civil service exam for any proper promotional process for all titles above lieutenant, including captain, deputy chief, and beyond. To add insult to injury, our members treatment is starkly different from other first responders and uniformed emergency services. A headline in the Daily News confirmed record high New York City 9-11 calls, bulk handled by EMS, the lowest paid first responders. The report goes on to confirm that the FDNY handled a record of 1.8 million calls last year. And of those, EMS handled 1.5 million. And EMS did this with less members than any other emergency service or first, respond, first responder services. Yet EMT base salaries start around $30,000 a year and cap at around $51,000 after five years. Paramedics who have earned, who have even more medical training and certification start around $45,000 with lieutenants and captains top pay capped at $71,000 to $75,000 respectively. On their own, these salaries are alarming for trained emergency medical staff in the city of New York and their supervisors, who literally put themselves in harm's way to save lives. But compare this to other first responders and uniformed services who all earn 40,000 or more annually, it does not go unnoticed that the common difference these other titles share is that they are much more white and much more male. This stark difference in pay and the demographic relationship underscores the severe problems with the lack of recognition and pay EMS members receive and the reasons this goes unremedied. This is not to say that there are not problems on the other side of the department or in other agencies. The impact of the problem with inequity manifests differently in the predominantly white and male side of the department and the predominantly of color and female side of the department EMS. But the problem is the same a fundamental institutional bias within the department that allows its non-white and female employees to be undervalued, undersupported, underemployed, underutilized, and underpaid. This has a profound negative effect on the lives of these workers, 
but it also negatively affects the quality of services the public relies on for emergency services in the city of New York. When we do not support those who provide life-saving services for New Yorkers, who literally bring, literally bring people back from the dead, we are threatening and diminishing those life-saving services New Yorkers depend on. In addition to this, there are numerous ways EMS workers are not recognized or supported. Some of these are small indignities, like not getting recognition in ceremonial events. Others are serious impediments, like not being entitled to unlimited sick leave that other first responders and uniformed emergency services are entitled to and receive. We look forward to working in partnership with this committee and the City Council to bring New York City as an employer into the 21st century and to build on work this body has already done to finally and fully end pay inequity in a New York City workforce. Uh, I'm available for any questions you may have, and I also have comments I'd like to bring up um, regarding the, the lies we heard previously here yeah, today. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I did prepare a testimony that I will read, but after listening to some of the answers that did come out today, um, as both my colleagues stated, there will be a lot of rebuttals. So I'd like to start off with, my name is Michael Greco, I'm the Vice President of Local 2507. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller, distinguished members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. Thank you for allowing me to, a chance to address you today on the issue of pay inequality in the FDNY. As you know, our union has been struggling with the impacts of pay inequality since becoming part of the FDNY. My president has already testified to pay disparity, but there are many other ways that our members face different treatment on the job. They are over-disciplined, they are not given unlimited sick leave, they face life-threatening work conditions and illnesses shoulder to shoulder with New York City first responders, yet are, given the are not given the recognition or even proper resources for this work. We are an integral and co-equal branch of New York City's emergency response system. While of course each agency is unique, there is a huge crossover of the services that are being provided. New York City's emergency services are comprised of an intricate web of highly trained first responders whose duties often overlap and who provide equally critical and interrelated life-saving care to New Yorkers. To put a face on it, we brought a lot of our members with us. Our members respond daily to every emergency that occurs in New York City, standing shoulder to shoulder with every service that answers a 911 call. We do not know what we're walking into, or what may be on the other side of the door, but that never slows us down. We were on the front lines on the response of 9-11, during Superstorm Standy. At every catastrophe the city has encountered, we were there. We often respond to medical emergencies that escalate into violence and jeopardize our safety. Every three years, we are required to renew our certifications just to maintain our jobs. That's right, we're one of the few civil servants who every three years we can be terminated just for not keeping up our certification. And we routinely have new responsibilities added to our job titles as technology evolves without compensation. With the recent polarized political climate in our country and threats against the city, EMS has become part of the city's counterterrorism task force. We are given military-grade ballistic gear to wear, aside from our personally issued ballistic gear, and must respond alongside with NYPD to active shooter scenarios, unarmed and vulnerable to harm. We respond to every emergency in New York, medical emergencies, rescue jobs, confined space rescues, train derailments, fires, car accidents, emotionally disturbed persons, and hazmat jobs, and that's just to name a few. Yet it seems like no matter how hard we try to address and remedy inequality among our ranks to recognize and compensate our members for these sacrifices. The city opposes these efforts. This is perhaps the greatest hurdle to addressing these issues. This administration needs to be a partner in acknowledging and remedying inequality instead of putting its efforts into pretending it's not happening. When Yadira Arroyo was killed in the line of duty, there was no requirement that her family receive the death benefits that she would have received had she been on another emergency service. While the city graciously elected to extend her those benefits, it took us 
going to New York State Legislature to pass the law that required EMS workers who die in the line of duty to be given the same death benefits. Equally, we had to fight this administration when it came to receiving paid sick leave for first responders who were suffering with illnesses relating to their work on 9-11. These should not have to be fought for with the city. That we need to do this underscores the profound lack of value and disrespect our members face, a sentiment that was recently underscored in a statement by the mayor that we are underpaid because our work is different. Our members still do not get unlimited sick leave like other first responders. And of course, it does not go unnoticed that our members are largely female and predominantly of color. We are told constantly that this is a collective bargaining issue. While it is true that collective bargaining is part of the problem, it only exacerbates what is already biased. To illustrate the unfair nature of pattern bargaining, for example, when one group gets 10%, and everyone has to follow the same pattern. It doesn't take a degree in sta uh, statistics to figure out that 10% of 50,000 compared to 10% of 100,000 only adds to the pay gap. The problems with discriminatory pay practices will only be fully resolved citywide when the city is forced to acknowledge there is a problem and begin the process of working co collaboratively with the unions and employees who are harmed by these practices. A lot of effort was put into getting diverse applicants to the fireside. They make it sound like it was such a great idea of theirs to get the diversity. They were sued, they lost the lawsuit, so now they have to add those diversity problems. Meanwhile, the service that exceeds and thrives in diversity is used and abused. They parade us around and show us how diverse we are. EMS lead the first in, uh, in diversity when it comes to EMS. They applaud the recent hirings of upper chiefs and management. However, they are still $50,000 short per year of their counterparts. It is a problem. It's basically saying, I'm about to say that the FDNY treatment of us is like saying, I'm not racist. I have a black friend. <laughs> Liz, we, we really hope that this committee will continue to be the champion for the city workers and help us in our fight to eradicate pay equality in New York City. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So I... Beautiful. Um, Please, I wish the floor. House member? Yeah, go ahead. Just go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wasn't expecting that so soon. Well... <laughs> Uh, I really, really appreciate you being here today. And uh, the value of your testimony uh, for me goes beyond words. Um, the council knows how valuable you are. It is unfortunate that we have continued to watch the perpetuation of a tale of two cities, even though we were promised something different a few years ago. So, uh, as we sit here listening to the testimony, listening to the stories, listening to the plight of our hardworking, uniformed probation officers, our, our FDNY, EMT, EMS paramedics who are out there on the forefront every single day and driving this message home to all that may need to hear this story. I'm just going to put into the record, you heard me question, uh, so you already know where that, where that stands. I'm, I'm just going to put out there for the record. So we're looking at a probation officer after five years gets over $54,000, almost $55,000. A correction officer after five and a half years gets a little over $85,000. EMTs after five years get a little over $50,000. FDNY after five years gets more than $100,000. And that shows a value statement by this city and by this administration that we don't treat equally our law enforcement and first responders. They are all, you are all valued and valuable first responders. 
by every stretch and means of the, of the imagination and reality of this life. We value some over others, but expect the same level of commitment and the same level of hard work by everybody. So in my opinion, panel, pay equity isn't negotiable. It's not something that should be something to be used as a ping pong ball across a table to be played with. It is something that should be given by this city without question. And that's all I have to say about that. I'd like to bring up something. I wanted to say, make some comments before I think it's important. Uh, something I want to uh, speak about. It was mentioned uh, by Chairman uh, Miller uh, about public safety. And this is a public safety issue. I've heard people make comments, it's a contract issue, it's a labor issue, it's, it is a public safety issue. Uh, the College of Emergency Medical, Medical Physicians and Cardiologists did a research study that showed there is a correlation between the years of experience of an EMT or paramedic to the patient outcome and survival rate of that patient. And they've shown the more experienced the EMT or paramedic, the better the patient outcome and the, more, the increase in survival rate, over 20, 23% was the actual number they used. To back that up, the fire department did a survey. They did a research uh, analysis and they found that whenever an EMS lieutenant or captain is on the scene of an emergency medical assignment, cardiac arrest, the patient outcome improves and the survival rate also increases. Now I have to ask myself, well, it's not that the EMTs or medics are doing you know, something wrong that the supervisor has to be on top of them to watch them. It really backs up the original research done by the college because over 60% of the EMTs and paramedics have less than three years on the job. And now that number's probably even higher because we just left another 1,000 people to go to fire. So the average lieutenant and captain has over seven years or 10 or 15 years on the job. So when you look at it, you have a lieutenant and captain there, it does improve the overall care because you have an experienced EMT or paramedic on that job. And let me tell you, we are so understaffed, it doesn't happen often enough. So they're literally, every single day, Many New Yorkers are dying. They're dying because we have a mill. The academy is a mill churning out people every day. That attrition rate you heard of at six or nine percent is laughable. That is not a true attrition rate. Over the last 12 months, we had over 1,000 members go to fire. That's 25 percent turnover. And they don't just go to fire. They also go to, I, we have members with 15 years on the job go to sanitation started to do over another 20 years. That's how bad it is here, that somebody's willing to work 35 years to get a pension and, and, and to leave EMS, to start over again, to start a new career. They, they, they talked about they're gonna spend $52 million on a Bureau of Training expansion. Well, you wouldn't need to make the academy so much bigger if you just paid these people enough to stay here and not leave. You wouldn't have to hire so much. Um, sanitation, we're comparing everything to fire. I, I want to make it clear, we're lower paid than all the uniform services. Sanitation earns forty dollars to $50,000 more a year. The person coming to pick up your trash earns forty dollars to $50,000 more than the EMT or paramedic coming to save your life. That is absolutely insane and ridiculous, and it needs to stop. This is that we know about the tale of two cities because we live it in EMS every single day. And this mayor should not just be all about words and say we're different. Yeah, we're different. We're doing a lot more work for a lot less pay. We need to start putting things in action, and he needs to correct this injustice. Thank you very much. That's it. Please, yeah, we, we, we have to do this. There's other hearings going on, and, and so uh, please, um, this is the way that we uh, demonstrate our concerns here um, by doing this. So in, in the future, do not clap. President Powell? 
I just wanted to make some comments and highlights. Um, it's very disturbing. <clears throat> First of all, I have retirees and active members here from the Department of Probation. And I just want to acknowledge them, and I want to thank them for their support. But I want to make a very important highlight about probation officers. To come in the door as a probation officer, you have to have a college degree. You cannot get this job without a bachelor's in either experience, like it was said, or a master's degree. And now the department is heavily hiring people with master's degrees. And to come in here with 40 something thousand dollars and to try to take care of a family, I did an assessment of the rents in New York City. And I took $78,000 a year. I think I make that. I'm not really sure. And I divided that into 26 checks. I think it's about $3,000 every two weeks. It sounds like a lot. Then you take out the taxes. And if you want to live in a place that's decent in New York, you're talking about $2,000 for a two-bedroom. It depends on the neighborhood. Easy. Or one-bedroom. When you take that away, you have nothing too much left to really to take care of your family. But some things I wanted to mention, they talk about access to promotion and stuff like that. The, the, the two areas where we can take in the civil service exam is from a POT to a, to a PO, from an SPO to a to an APO, which is also known in-house, a branch chief, branch chief position. That exam hasn't been in a while. Right now, we have a supervisor's test coming up. But to add insult to in, injury, and I just want to just tap it, then I'm going to come back to this. The ability to grow is kind of like an insult now because they recently brought in civilians from the outside for a position that's normally a civil service exam for supervising probation officer. And that's a concern now. I am just going to tap that and I'm going to come back over here. Um, the gain sharing they mentioned. The gain sharing is something that was negotiated with the previous um, pro pro president. I wasn't the president at the time. So certain things that they were mind boggled about, I'm the, I wasn't the president, I'm the president now. Gang sharing is something that the senior officers get every, every four months. Since 2004, there was an agreement with the city that these officers that come on after 2004, they don't get the, don't get the gang sharing anymore. So that's, a, that's a something that's not, a, when you talked about compensations. The maintenance they talked about, we just got that for the first time, maintenance allowance. We did, come, we did agree on something, we agreed on um, the shirts and the jackets to start with. And during our first time ever, we got maintenance allowance for the shirts and the jackets. And I'm hoping that we can come become completely uniform because of the work that we do and the neons that you hear about. You walk in the neons, you don't know who's a probation officer and you don't know who's a civilian. You went to our neon in the Bronx. So we, we're in environments now that it's the kumbaya everybody. Everybody's supposed to be together, but we don't know who's who. So that's the reason I'm pushing for the uniforms now. Um, and that collective bargaining, we, we, just, we, we just settled. Um, we did, our attorney, Harry Greenberg, did come up with innovative ways to try to resolve some of that, not knowing that we can't do it all at one time, at least crack the egg, and it was denied. And it was denied, and it wasn't, and it wasn't about, and I'm not gonna get into that further neither, but it wasn't about freezing anybody's um, um, salaries, not at all, because we would never do that, because we're about representing our members. And this is an issue that shouldn't be taken personally with none of the administrations. This is an issue that's been going on historically from, time, from the time, I don't know when, I don't know how it got so, the way that it did, but as my brothers are here that's saying, it's very insulting that we have to sit here and um, have these conversations. Probation officers have to requalify those who carry every year, and we also have to have the same Article 35 training as NYPD and corrections. And I want to make that very, very clear, that it is, yes, very insulting that we have to sit here, once again, cup in hand, asking it to be filled up to feed our families. I just want to touch on a few things. At our next contract, if there's going to be a dotted line to sign for 6% or 9% attrition, we'll take that in a heartbeat. As my colleague said, 25% of our members leave to NYPD, sanitation, corrections, MTA. Anything that is, becomes available, they jump on. Nobody is staying in EMS. In the past 24 hours, six of our members were assaulted beat up while treating patients. That's just in the past 24 hours. I want to personally thank you, Mr. Miller, for bringing up the uniform status. In 2001, we won this decision in the appellate court in New York State. 18 years later, we're still battling this issue. 18 years to be recognized for a job that's well-deserved, 
by everybody in this room. You asked about the responsibilities, have they increased and has the pay increased? They responded by giving us a differential for hazmat. While that is true, they threw additional responsibilities as far as AED, albuterol, EpiPen, any type of drug or training that is necessary for us, they throw, us, they throw at us without any additional compensation. The OT cap, the overtime cap, they didn't do us a favor by lifting it. There's nobody to fill these ambulances. We're running down 30, 40 trucks every tour, every day. There's a delay for hours sometimes for somebody to get an ambulance for a non-emergency call, but they're still waiting. Speaking of mandatory overtime, which is partially delaying our next negotiation, they want to make it part of our contract that it's mandatory for you to come in on your day off. They also mentioned that when they merged with us, we were 3,100, and that they added 1,000 members since we merged. Again, you're not doing us a favor. 4,100 is not enough to handle 5,000 calls a day. We should be at 5,000, maybe 6,000 members, including supervisors, to handle the call volume. It is so bad that they're calling in outsiders, contractors, to help us with these 911 emergencies. The training, three to four months to become an EMT, nine months to become a paramedic. If they throw three EMT classes a year, that's 540 people each year for the past five years. You do the math again, that's not 9%. That's 20 to 25% each year that we're losing. They're spending millions and millions each year on training people who are not staying. It costs 40 to $50,000 to train each paramedic, 20 to $30,000 to train each EMT. You multiply that by 600 people, and you end up with the millions. I, I want to touch on that number. Um, the, we had the fire department sit up here and testify that it's $22,000 to train a paramedic. I'll be the first to admit I wasn't very good in college. Um, a top pay EMT is $50,000 a year. It takes nine months to train a paramedic. So if you take a top pay EMT and take them off the street, for nine months, that's three quarters of the year. You take three quarters of the salary they would have earned and you have to pay them to learn. That's $37,500 a year. I'm pretty sure that's, again, you don't need a statistician for that. So how is their numbers that they're giving me, this is the same people who said six and 9% attrition, are the same people telling you it's $22,000 to train. They didn't give the cost of the trainers, cost of the books, the materials, overtime, uh, overtime that people have to, to, to do it, the cost to cover the ambulance tours that are being run down because you now have 70 people in a class. So where are they getting these numbers? And they're, they're coming up here. They're the same ones that are telling you creative solutions to, to our pay. Creative solution, oh, we gave them a differential of 6% to the hazmat. We paid for it. Oh, creative solutions, like, you know, well, EMD is going to get a differential. We sued them for it, and they still haven't paid us. <laughs> Arbitration decisions for the PRU, they sued them for it. And now we're in negotiations to try and figure out what that money is going to be. We are suing them left and right. We should not have to sue the city one more time. But guess what? Two years FOIL requests two years to ask for information that when I put it down on my application, it said to be used for this stuff. 
So if I said I'm white, you're now going to say, I'm sorry, I can't give you your own information that you put down. But they're going to block us every chance. Every chance the city has, and it's not so much FDNY or NYPD, it's New York City. Mayor de Blasio is right now single-handedly responsible, and he could fix this. But where is he? Not here. Iowa, Iowa New Hampshire. It's his responsibility to sit down. When they say OLR, I'm pretty sure he's the boss of OLR. I'm pretty sure he has the ability to say, well, you know what? Don't leave a room until you fix this. He created $100 million for a health insurance program piloted in the Bronx. That money's there. He can do these sort of things. Mayor de Blasio, this blood is on his hands. And I cannot thank you guys enough because you are the ones here. So I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You're letting me vent, but the voice that's coming out, the emotion that's coming out, I'm representing their frustration, their frustration. You guys are the ones that we elect to hold this mayor's feet to the fire. And I don't want lip service from the fire department, from their accounting people, or from anybody else to deny us what is rightfully ours. And I stand with my sister over at, at, at probation because it is unheard of. We're looking at each other, we're in the same situation. And the irony is not lost on me that the three of us up here, one, two, three, are some of the whitest people you'll come across. <laughs> The irony is not lost, but I'll stand up and I'll look at everybody in this room and I'll let them stand up. This is the diversity we represent. I have women. I dare you to get some of my other services in here with this sort of diversity. We let them know about this yesterday. This is the response we get in six hours of notice. Imagine if we did something more serious with more time, more preparation. It would be illegal. We would never do it. <laughs> but it shows you the power, it shows you the power of FDNY EMS, of Local 2507, of our brothers and sisters over at probation. We do the work. We know we're getting underpaid, but we would never do anything to harm the citizens in New York. Every single one of my brothers and sisters here took an oath to do no harm, and that's what we do every single day, despite getting spit on in the face by not only patients, but our own mayor. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions. We and we <laughs> and and, and um, a few things I, I just want to get on the record. Um, President Powell, how, how many cases does your member? What, what's the caseload look like? Could you explain that? The caseload. The caseload can vary depending on the assignment and where they're working in the borough. Mm -hmm. um, the Bronx, I believe, has the highest numbers in cases. And remember, probation is, is broken into family court and adult services. So adult always is going to have more cases in fam well, than family. And, and, and then, um, but it depends on the assignment, because we supervise and we work with people from all different um, types of crimes that they commit. We have sex offenders. We have. Um, um, robbery, we have the raw case of robbery, assault, and weapons. We have anything that's in the prison, we have out here. So when I tell people when they think about probation, look out the window, there's no gates, but we're holding it down. But our case low can be from, they're supposed to be, depending on the unit, and somebody jump in, please, for a sex offender is what, 60, Clark? It's supposed to be 60 in the Bronx. It's supposed to be 60 across the board, but like I said, that could fluctuate, because that now can have less. So it varies. But from my last calculation, there wasn't no 20,000 people on probation. There's over 30,000 people on probation. In a ratio of 840-some probation officers holding it down, that's mind-boggling. And city The city math, city right. Man. And the caseloads, I'll tell you one thing, Council Member, the work that we do is being piled on continuously with doing their data sheets and doing their work while we're supposed to be doing our work. But okay. one thing I want to tell you, too, as far as safety, I had an officer who had her arm locked down with a pit bull not so long ago. They don't talk about our safety issues. We got people coming into our locations with loaded firearms. They don't talk about that. They're not telling you the truth about that. I've asked for meetings to have safety, safety meetings with them, and, been, and they fell on deaf ears. And I'll probably hear something after this later, too, so I'll be waiting for it. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, Orin, what's the number of EMTs uh, that are currently uh, your membership number? 
Currently, we have about 3,900 members. And, and paramedics? It's about 1,000 paramedics, 2,900 EMTs. Okay. So on, in, 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 in uh, the first of the year, 2020, the first reporting um, on the data law, on the pay equity, we will receive from the city. The city um, will report and to give it to the council. The council will aggregate it, and we'll certainly get you guys back in here and all the problems that we've seen in Foreland over the, over the years and, and, and all directly related to collective bargaining. As you said, it very clearly, um, when we were negotiating over the last three years, why would someone who was advocating on behalf of themselves or their membership be concerned about, why are they more concerned about protecting the confidentiality of your membership than the membership about giving their resources and information to make that open so that they can achieve their goal. And so it really didn't make sense, but now it's the law, so um, we're, we're gonna be able to aggregate that information. We'll get everybody back in and, and um, be able to utilize it to, to achieve the goals that we we're talking about here today. And, and quite frankly, this is something that we've um, been working at for, for a number of years, obviously, uh, pay equity with CWA, but um, expanding that universe and, 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 and knowing that, that it has to start here, that we often uh, talk about private industry and, and put restraints on, on private industry and, and our house here in the city isn't together, that there is more pay equity and, and disparities uh, here than, than anywhere, and we, we have to lead here. So um, the council certainly, going to, this committee is going to certainly continue to do the work, um, provide to be your resource, to be your voice, and, and, and allow there for a space here in the people's house for you to come in, tell your story, and so that we can get to where we, we need to be. So there is, is, is certainly a, a partnership here. And, and, and most importantly, um, we value what you do. We value what you do. Um, obviously, this is all about public safety how, how, holistically, um, the various areas of it. And, and uh, as I stated before, the city only has value because of the people that serve, right? Otherwise, nobody wants to come to New York City. Um, the increases in, in, in dollars that were tax dollars that we've seen over the last five years that paid for a plethora of, of new programming should certainly go back into the pockets of the men and women that are responsible for it. So we don't have to be ultra creative about where the money is going to come from. You guys are making the money for the city, creating the value. So, um, but after, uh, again, after uh, the first of the year, the data is, uh, the first report is due, and uh, we're going to chop that up, and, and we're going to be right back here telling a story here and figuring out how we get to where we need to be, where is that everybody's being compensated equitably for the services that are being provided. So um, we, have, we have one more panel, and like you guys, I hope that you have work to do on the outside. Uh, it is election day, guys. <laughs> Just so you know, this building was That's locked. What we do. The building was locked down because we had so many members standing outside. Oh, excellent. Thank excellent. You Thank you. You're quite welcome. Next panel, Dr. Joseph Wilson, Erica Haley Kagan, Mariano Santiago, Mario Santiago and Greg Waltman. I, I got I to get back to the district. Man. I got my staff, everybody. I close the office, everybody's working close, but I, I don't feel comfortable being here and not being on the ground. Absolutely.
Greg Waltmar, Dr. Joseph Wilson, Mario Santiago, and of course, Erica. Good afternoon, Chairman Miller and members of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. My name is Erica Healy Kagan, and I work at the Curlin Group. We represent the two unions who shared their stories with you here today. We want to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today and about the ongoing challenges New York City civil servants face with regards to pay inequity. Members and leadership from the various unions that spoke today gave compelling examples of how discriminatory pay practices impact their members' employment including lack of recognition, hurdles with regards to opportunities for promotion, and inadequate and unequal compensation. As the demographics of the city's workforce have changed, the city's employment practices have failed to keep up and safeguard against discriminatory pay practices. This has resulted in segregated job titles, repressed minimum salaries, and crushing hurdles for career advancement, and the opportunity to earn a wage to meet today's cost of living. Whether intentional or otherwise, these practices do violate the city's own human rights laws. While the challenges manifest differently with the different titles, it is the same problem citywide. Unfortunately, however, the city's response to growing calls by municipal unions across the city's workforce to address and ensure equal employment opportunities have prompted more defensiveness and denial than the cooperation that we are asking for. The Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the landmark case of CWA Local 1180 versus the City of New York found in 2015 that the city engages in discriminatory pay practices across all agencies and that it failed to properly maintain records that could have avoided such discrimination. Last year, then public advocate Letitia James released an in-depth study confirming that the City of New York engages in systemic pay disparity based on race and gender, and that it is one of the worst actors with greater disparity in pay across race and gender than other governments and even some private employers. The studies also found that women of color in particular are disproportionately hurt by the gender wage gap, and that racial disparity in pay is greater in New York City than across the national average. It is not enough to simply desire non-discrimination in the workforce or announce a commitment to such non-discrimination. In ensuring non-discrimination is an affirmative responsibility that requires a constant commitment to look at the patterns, anticipate problems, and have a willingness to acknowledge and adjust to correct those problems when they occur. That is why it is especially concerning, despite this body's efforts through recent legislation and our office's affirmative litigation, the city is still fighting against disclosure of pay data that could identify and help to correct these pay disparities. The city's defensiveness to these problems is perhaps the biggest roadblock to progress. On behalf of our clients who consist of close to 10,000 city employees, our office thanks this committee for your willingness to push forward on this issue. Bringing public awareness to this issue is the first step. Continuing to work with these unions engaged in the process to share the employment data when it becomes available this year is another important step that will go a long way in helping to identify and working together to correct these problems. Thank you again for your time. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, Dr. Joseph Wilson here, and first of all, I want to thank uh, the committee members and uh, the chairman and uh, council member Adams for um, being such great advocates for justice and for equality. I'm representing uh, African American civilians in the FDNY who are currently engaged in a major class action lawsuit against the city in the FDNY, which is winding its way in federal court. And I'm here to express solidarity with our colleagues uh, who just spoke so eloquently about the pay disparities. And of course, we look back to the struggles of the Vulcan Society and their ability to wrestle a settlement from the city. 
but the work is not yet done. We certainly fervently in support of CWA Local 1180's struggle for justice in their settlement and the current litigation that's uh, being engaged at this moment. And I'm here just with a simple message to say that so much of what has been expressed is um, an expression or, or it's an understanding of the fact that our members and the people who we represent in the FDNY, in particular in this instance, the African American civilians, are tired of being second class citizens. And uh, Malcolm X said that a second class citizen is just a euphemism for a 20th century slave. We're tired of that. We're not gonna have that anymore. We realize this is a political battle, this is a legal battle, but this is also a moral battle. This is a moral outrage, moral injustice, and we need to join forces in solidarity and transform this gross injustice. Last point, it was just an observation, and it wasn't simply bad optics, but the fact that the city's administration walked out of the hearings without listening to the workers and to the workforce, the people who keep the city running, keep the city safe, is not only insulting, but it's endemic of their attitude of superiority, of control, of being tone deaf, and totally insensitive to the needs of the city and the workforce and true justice. So thank you for your work and for the opportunity to speak. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, General Counsel, Greg Waltman, speaking on behalf of G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company, just echoing the comments and sentiments from my colleagues regarding this issue and the pay inequality. Obviously, we remain steadfast to our promise and obligation and um, in, you know, concurrent from yesterday and the dialogue from yesterday. Uh, regarding asset origination from New York to offset fiscal budgetary concerns and different types of pay inequality as it pertains to this matter. Um, just speaking on uh, the 9-11 Family Survivors Fund and the type of value improperly for monopoly politics that goes into that, it just isn't, I mean, at this point, acceptable. Um, obviously, the fiscal and budgetary concerns are offset by um, proprietary types of innovation and public and private partnerships that can be created in creating these synergies. So for value narratives to uh, plague um, mass media and the public to deter resolution in this matter isn't acceptable. And again, we remain steadfast to our commitment. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, in the absence of uh, Chair Miller that had to step out and take a call, uh, I will just say that your presence here today, as with everyone else that testified, was absolutely invaluable. We appreciate your time. We appreciate everything that you put into what you do on a daily basis in the interest of the people of the city of New York. So thank you very much for your time today and your testimony. Thank you. And with that, if there are is nothing else to be said? Any more members of the public wishing to testify? This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>